check on some cows. Um, and she says, ooh, can I come? <laughs> She's also one of our own because she is not only a professor at one of our denominational seminaries, um, but she is also a uh, general synod professor of theology. And what that means is that she is concerned not just for the students at the seminary, but for the teaching ministry of the whole church. So she comes to us today as fulfillment of part of that ministry. But centrally, she is one of our own because she believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and has a deep and abiding faith in Him. The Holy Spirit is um, animates her every being. Um, so I'd like you to pray with me um, that the Holy that the God would um, speak to us well through her this morning. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for this, your servant, Carol. We ask God that you would bless her, her attention to your word and her love of it. Lord, catch us up into what it is that you are doing. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you. Um, and it's such a pleasure for me to see my former students, Noah and Kristen, here in their new natural habitat. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish you the joy of them. And I'm sure that you've already experienced that joy and that blessing. And I pray that you will continue to do so for, for many years. It's just wonderful to receive this invitation to be with you today as I read our scripture lessons. I want you to be alert for the invitations in these words from God. The first passage is from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, picking up with verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you hear the invitations? Today's passages are all about invitations. We just heard in the Gospel passage, Jesus inviting us to Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And the prophet Isaiah has an equally appealing offer. Are you thirsty? He asks. Well, then come to the water. Are you hungry? Come, buy and eat. It doesn't matter if you don't have any money. Just come. Buy wine and milk without money and without Price. I've always thought that was a mysterious invitation. I mean, there are probably enough dairy farmers in this congregation to wonder, how can one buy milk without money? Uh, I'm not going to get a very big check uh, that way. 
If you want the answer to that question, then you're going to have to stay tuned for the rest of the sermon because I'm not going to I'm not going to address it now. But I want you to hear the invitations, these wonderful, mysterious invitations from God, from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus Christ. And speaking of wonderful invitations, mysterious invitations, we have a baptism today. And how delighted I was when Noah and Kristen invited me to baptize baby Brennan today. You know, seminary professors don't get to baptize babies very often. And so it's, it's really special when we get that chance. But it's always special, isn't it? Always special because it points to something, it points to the mystery that lies at the heart of our faith. We love because God first loved us. We love because God first loved us. In the last hymn that we sang today, you'll hear a, a version of that same idea. The hymn says, I sought the Lord, but afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. We love, but we love because God first loved us. When we look at it that way, we realize that baptism itself is an invitation, an invitation from God to come to the water. We're going to talk a bit more about what that means, but but finally, I don't want you to miss out on one more very important invitation for today. Let today be an invitation for you to remember the significance of your own baptism. Notice I said remember the significance of your own baptism, because I'm sure some of you were baptized as infants, so you don't remember the event itself. But you can remember its importance, its significance. And so I invite you. God invites you every time there's a baptism to remember the meaning in your own baptism and to to renew your sense of what it means to be a child of the covenant. So that's our opportunity today. That's our invitation. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to baptize a baby in my home congregation. Spring Valley Reformed Church in Fulton, Illinois. And it's a little country church, and Spring Valley looks a lot like Clymer, New York. I mean, the hills here are bigger. The hills here are bigger than in most places. But, but the places have a lot in common, and maybe that's why I feel so at home here. Brennan, you just get it out now, sir, and we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> Although I've always said there is no way in the world a baby can spoil baptism. <laughs> no way in the world. In any case, when I did this baptism back at my home church in Spring Valley, the RCA had just come out with a new edition of the baptismal liturgy, the words that we use uh, during baptism. So I decided it would be a perfect opportunity to, to break it in uh, here at my home church. Now, not everything about the liturgy was new. Um, and even the parts that had just been added were, in fact, quite old. Uh, they were just new to us. Uh, they were rediscovered, as it were, from liturgies that had been used for centuries in brother and, and sister churches around the world. But, but my favorite new old feature uh, is the moment just before the baptism itself. It's the moment when the parents hand the baby over to the minister. And by the way, as a parent, I, I found that moment singularly terrifying. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very different when you're on the parental side of the font. And you have to hand the baby over, usually to some big guy in a robe with a loud voice that's in, on a microphone on top of things. But, I'll try not to be that threatening today. But, okay, so it's just before the baptism itself. 
the minister's holding the baby, and the two of them, the minister and the baby, have this little talk. And the rest of the congregation is sort of invited to listen in on it, but essentially this is a talk between the minister and the baby. And I, I love this part, so I used it that morning at, at Spring Valley Reformed. Sydney Clare, I said, that was the baby's name, Sydney Clare, for you, Jesus died. For you, Jesus came into the world. For you, Jesus died. For you, Jesus conquered death. Yes, for you, little one, though you know nothing of it as yet. We love because God first loved us. Wow. When I said that, there was an audible gasp that sort of rippled through the congregation. It wasn't one of shock. It was, it was just as if the whole congregation had sort of taken a breath together. And I, I was sort of surprised and distracted by it, but I, I went on. Um, afterwards, though, I, I asked someone if they had noticed it, and they said, oh, yeah. I said, well, what was, what was that about, do you think? And, and she said, I think, I think that was the moment we got it. We got infant baptism for the first time. We love because God first loved us. Isn't that a mystery at the heart of our faith? And it's a mystery that's revealed not to the wise and the intelligent, but to and through infants. You know, when a, when a grown-up comes to be baptized, it's a wonderful thing, obviously. But when a grown-up comes to the font, it's easier to get confused, isn't it? Confused that maybe they've earned their way to the font. But, but when a baby is brought to the font, often it's not kicking and screaming, there's no doubt about who's getting the job done here. It's not the baby, although we hope the baby will respond to the grace in which he or she stands. It's not the parents, although we pray that they will raise this child to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the baby, it's not the parents. It's God. It's God who's doing the heavy lifting here. Do you remember, do you remember what God said through the prophet Isaiah? to the exiles. In that passage we read this morning, come, God says to them, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now the reason the food is free is not because it isn't valuable. In fact, it's priceless. It's life itself. And no currency could cover the cost, even if we had a nickel to our name, which we don't. We don't have to pay because it's already been paid for. God has picked up the tab, as it were. That's the point. That's why we sing in the, in the words of an old hymn maybe you're familiar with. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay you, I do adore you and will ever praise you. Think on your pity and your love unswerving, not my deserving. That's from the hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. We can't work our way into God's good graces. We can only respond to God's grace. And that's such a hard lesson for us to learn, especially in a culture that stresses rugged individualism. We want to do it our own way, even when it comes to matters of salvation. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. If you haven't, then you have a lot to look forward to. Maybe I can whet your appetite a little bit today, because what we're talking about here this morning reminds me a lot of that part in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where the character Eustace tries to undragon himself. That will be clear in a minute. But first let me tell you a little bit about who Eustace is as a character. Several words come to mind. Whiner, 
wimp, pain in the neck, even, even traitor. But most of all, I think Eustace is selfish. Selfish. He's greedy, self-centered, worships big time at the altar of Eustace. Well, in that strange magic of that place called Narnia, Eustace turns into what he really is. A dragon, a hoarding, greedy, scaly dragon. But thanks to the intervention of the all-powerful lion, Aslan, he doesn't stay that way. Aslan leads the miserable, dragony Eustace through the moonlight to a garden. And in the middle of the garden, there is a well with water bubbling up from the bottom, C.S. Lewis says, like a big round bath with marble steps going down into it. Eustace longs to bathe in this pool because he knows that somehow it can heal him. But he also knows that he has to shed his dragon skin before he can step into that water. And so I want to pick up with the part where he tries to undragon himself. Eustace is speaking here and he says, I started scratching myself and my scales, uh, and my scales began coming off all over the place. And then I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, like it does after an illness, or as if I was a banana. In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty. But it was a most lovely feeling. So I started to go down into the well for my bathe. But just as I was going to put my foot into the water, I looked down and I saw that it was all hard and rough and wrinkly and scaly, just as it had been before. Oh, that's all right, said I. It only means I have another smaller suit on underneath the first one, and I'll have to get out of that too. So I scratched and tore again, and this underskin peeled off beautifully, and out I stepped, and I left it lying beside the other one, and I went down to the well for my bathe. Well, exactly the same thing happened again. And I thought to myself, oh dear, however many skins have I got to take off? I was longing to bathe, so I scratched away for the third time and I got off a third skin just like the two others and I stepped out of it. But as soon as I looked at myself in the water, I knew it was no good. And then the lion said, but I don't know if he spoke it out loud, but I heard him say, you will have to let me undress you. I was pretty afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now, too. So I just, I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff Peel off. Think of this morning's children's sermon about sin. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, and just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, except that that hadn't hurt, and there it was lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more novelly looking than the others had been. And there was I, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had been. And then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath by now, now that I had no skin on. But he caught hold of me, and he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone. And then I saw why. I had turned into a boy again. Don't you want to go read the rest of that book? I hope so. Wouldn't 
would you like to be healed like that? To be made whole again? Well, it's time to listen to our invitations then. Come. Come to the well as old as the world. Come as that wonderful, wounded child of God that you are. That wonderful, wounded child of God that Christ died for. Come and remember the ways God has peeled off all those brittle, crusty layers that encase our desperate hearts. Come and remember the way that God has tossed us stinging into the clear, cool waters of our baptism. Come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.